I'm just going to give everyone one, sen one sentence introductions uh, just before they come up because uh, who needs to read how many books Mark Ford has published, really? Um, so we will begin with Mark Ford, who is a real big deal in poetry. Mark, take the <laughs> Uh, that's very kind. I um, don't recognise myself. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll read. Uh, I've been um, translating Jules Laforgue um, for the last few months for a small press called the Song Cave, which um, Jeffrey is involved with. Terrific little press in Brooklyn that do um, uh, Trevor Winkfield, all, all sorts of poets related to the New York School. And they got in touch last year saying somebody had dropped out of their schedule and would I. Could I fill it? So I thought I, I'd been translating a bit of La Fourgue, so I put together um, versions of La Fourgue poems, and I'll read some of those to start off with. It's been, uh, I mean, you've probably come across La Fourgue, who's the main influence on early T.S. Eliot, and it's been interesting from that angle um, as well. Um, he was slightly obsessed with Hamlet. Um, he, he, had, he, his, um, he, had, he had a very short life, um, but he was taught English by someone called Leah Lee, uh, who... Um, and she taught him English, and they read Hamlet together. And he went to Elsinore, and this is a poem actually dated, Copenhagen, Elsinore, 1st January, 1886, called Warning. When my father, a shy, stern man, died, his features were unrelenting. I'd barely known my mother. I was nearing 20. So I took up writing, but I kept hearing that demon, Truth, whistling over my efforts. These effusions, my dear boy, really, have you not done? I hadn't the heart to get married, feeling for myself only bitter contempt. And they proved real sticklers, inflexible, however much they seemed to be in ecstasy. Which is why I gad about, dither, somehow survive a weather vane buffeted by the 36 seasons, too many for me to cope with. Take heed, I say, of my dismal example, O youth of today. Um, uh, and this is uh, one of many poems called Dimanche. Um, one of the great things about Le Fourg is he, he always gives poems the same title, um, <laughs> many called Sundays, which has a, an epigraph from Hamlet. Hamlet, have you a daughter? Um, she got it wrong. Polonius, I have my lord. Let, uh, uh, let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Rain, pointless rain, relentless rain, falls into the river. Il pleut, il pleut, bergère. Sunday is a rest day for the river. Not a barge moves upstream or down. Vespers ring out over town. The banks are deserted, dispiriting. Girls from the local boarding school pass. Oh, how deeply I pity them. Some already wearing their winter muffs. One who has neither muff nor furs and is dressed all in grey seems particularly miserable. <laughs> Suddenly she breaks ranks and runs. Oh my God, what's got into her? She's going to throw herself into the river. And there's not a boatman, not a rescue dog in sight. Night falls and the little port is lit up. Ah, it's all so recognisable. And the rain continues to fall into the river. Pointless, relentless. Um, and I'll read one, this is a, quite a bit longer, uh, it's, uh, um, from the Dernier Vert. He wrote these 12 Dernier Vert towards the end of his life. Um, he met Leah Lee, and she has a bad cough that she, uh, he refers to in this poem. And that um, uh, cough turned out to be tuberculosis, which she gave to him. Um, they came over to uh, London, in fact, in um, uh, 1885, right at the end of 1885, and got married in London. In the same church, incidentally, which Eliot married Valerie later on. So <laughs> there was a little coincidence there. And they went back to Paris, and he died about in August, about eight months later, and she died the following year. Of, uh, um, so, but towards just uh, in 1885, in the late period, he writes, he invents vers libre, basically. This is the first version of, 
of their lieb uh, in these poems called Derni, which are, were published just before he died in magazines. Um, this one's called Luna Solo. I smoke spread out beneath the evening sky on the top deck of a careering stagecoach, every bone in my body rattling, jangling, but my soul is a dancing aerial, my soul whirls beyond bitterness and cloying honey, beyond the passing roads and hills and valleys, and even my own tobacco fumes. And dancing, it recalls that we fell crazily in love, and yet we parted without mentioning the fact. Spleen drove me away, spleen, all invading spleen. Her eyes were eloquent. Do you get it? Or rather, why, oh why, do you not get it? Neither would make that first move. We had to fall simultaneously together to our knees, you see. Where, I wonder, is she now? Perhaps crying. Where is she right now? Take care, at any rate, I beg you, do take care. How cool the woods on either side of the road, the road, oh shawl of melancholy, souls are listening, alert, and it's my life inspiring their envy. Magic enfolds the upper deck of this diligence. Let's stockpile whatever can't be fixed, bid higher and higher on our fate, there are more stars than grains of sand in the seas where others have seen her bathing. All slides as ever towards death, no shelter from that storm. The years over all that has happened will pour and our hearts will harden, leaving us muttering. I can see it now, if only I'd known, married or unmarried, if only, if only I'd known. Accursed be our wretched rendezvous. My heart was a sealed box. My behaviour was not good. Mad as hatters for happiness, what on earth shall we do now? How can we square my soul with her gullible youth? Must I spend evening after evening wildly defending, O oh hardened sinner, your non-existent honour? Do you, her eyes flashed, see... How, her eyes flashed, can you possibly not see? Yet no avowal followed, no falling to our knees. The moon rises and the road is like a dream. We sped past cotton mills and sawmills, but now only milestones mark our progress and pink candy floss clouds and a frail crescent moon. It unfurls our dreamy road, unaccompanied by music. In pine wood forests where night since time began has resigned, has reigned, are swept and secret rooms. To these one might elope. I people the woods, imagine myself among handsome lovers escaping the law, excited, gesticulating. And now I cast them behind, am Ariel himself on this winding road, awaited by no welcoming host, only the and friendship of some hotel room. The moon rises above the oniric endless road. We reach a staging post and lighted lanterns, a glass of milk and cries of drive postillion, drive amid chirping crickets beneath the stars of July. My misfortune is drowning in moonlight. In flare, sorry, I'll go back. <laughs> My misfortune is drowning in moonlight, in flares like wedding fireworks, in the shadowy poplars overarching the road, in the song the mountain torrent sings to itself in the rising waters of Lethe. Luna solo, you outwit my pen this night on the road, and stars, you scare me, so many of you out there. Oh, fleeting hour, how I wish I could preserve your inspiration and draw on it as autumn looms. The temperature has dropped, and she may be drifting through some forest. She loves to wander late, drowning her sorrows in nuptial moonlight. She'll have forgotten her scarf, and the night's beauties will have her wrapped in wonder. She'll catch cold. Oh, please take care. 
what I would give never again to have to hear your coughing. Once more, why, oh why, oh why, did we fail to tumble, fainting at each other's feet? I might have been the paragon of spouses, and no frou-frou will ever compare with the frou-frou made by your dress when you move. Yeah, that was very late uh, La Four poem, um, and that book will be out in November, and I'll just read one of my own poems that also uh, it is called um, Phobic. Uh, it also turns the page, so it'll take you a couple of minutes. Phobic. If speed, glorious speed, is ever admired of the negligent, yet brooding labyrinthine man must halt and cup an ear, emit a sigh or groan as he entangles himself in cord paid out by a distressed and tearful Ariadne. Oh, my adversary, watch him clutch at his straying wits like some floppity straw man. Now that you built the lofty, nay, vertiginous rhyme, and father, dear father, is so much ash aligned with inventive earth, and Phobos, our ancient battle-scarred deity, is fleeing himself, eyes fixated on the luminous future. And fakery has annexed the split second between stimulus and response and drowns out like a juggernaut the cries of all those it sideswipes. And bindweed has ensnared the jasmine as testosterone levels are falling and all's on show. And a writhing octopus has fastened its suckers to neck and to groin, while the heart is a pitter pat pattering as steady as a car emitting carbon monoxide. And affixed to the lintels of your doorpost is no junk mail. And the imperium in your bones keeps hurting, hunting, hustling, humbugging, helter skeltering towards the exit. And aha! In the pelting rain, you've learned your fiery shorthand merely smoulders and fumes. And further, when this or that row of ducks gets lined up, hey presto, it's A, N, other who blasts from the hip, wreathed in rings of smoke and gently drifting feathers. And the more querulous your outbursts, the more futile have grown the hours spent wooing sleep. And the lurking aroma of bleach in the sinus has linked itself with catastrophe and cannot be expelled. And your mastery of the art of withdrawal and the non sequitur has proved a glittering red herring. And revolution hangs in the margins, its own parody, a spectre expounding the demise of other ghosts. And fresh blurrings and scumblings and urinary tract issues and loss of natural habitat, unreal as if subtitled, I've started, so I'll finish. And hopes are fading of ever getting your glands, your pitiless glands, to behave as they should. And where, you wonder, oh where is the fizz and oomph, the punch, the leap and slam dunk, c'est flétrie, mon cher, flétrie. For to love is to be afraid, and not just of irony. Between two people, the night's terrors surge and unfold themselves, exhaust the small hours, lock horns at dawn, while barely grimly acknowledging her rosy fingers, the overactive amygdala lays down the law. In habit, she insists, our hollowed-out democracy, and exploit your fears like any high-performing algorithm would or does. Time passing equals destiny, and both flow chaotically or merely percolate, get scrunched up, smoothed out. Allow this weeping, giggling, blood-curdling fit to subside, and between unnerving bouts of self-starvation, you'll feel as light as attic dust or smoke or pollen, a trustful might afloat again, wrestling with indigence, with better judgment.
Thank you very much, Mark. Um, next up, we have Dr. Agnieszka, who is uh, learning to call herself a doctor. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read four poems today, and the first one's called Attic, and, uh, no it's not, <laughs> the first one's called Architecture, and uh, it opens a, a dialogue on structures really, um, the structures of humanity, the structures we build for ourselves, and the structures that, um, that, that we, we, that ourselves um, uh, uh, so the structures we build for ourselves but also those that are built for us really architecture lines annex and rive bracket paper landscapes and lines of humanity clayed and constructed called upon materials of tenure and term what is the space if not us Configured nests and soft symmetries, bodies in lovemaking, irregular forms of sensuality, criss-crossing conceptions, solidity and our names. Penciled identities, you touch this groundwork. Draw my lineation, feel the edges like a rough cut, erase me, insert me back. Erase me again in lust and downfall and draftsmanship. We lose our footing. In these skin stone buildings, we build from ourselves. We are invisible lines of sculpture and detail, thresholds in need of safety. We hammer and knock, secure flesh and facades in our tentative versions. Align blood with the grind of history. Our undeclared kisses blown apart. Um, the next poem is called Attic. <laughs> and um, it starts off with, um, with an epi uh, epigraph from May May uh, Bersenbrugger's uh, poem called Nest from her collection of the same title. And... Um, a lot of my work has previously dealt with structures and houses and places and displacements. And uh, she has this, just, just this wonderful line in Nest uh, that says, um, my origin is a linguistic surface like a decorated wall. And so I just kind of responded to that. Attic. The cutting of the white rose bush is sent by post. Roots like a spider's caticular hairs navigating away in this sensory field of plant, source, descent. Upstairs, the builders pull apart the attic. Brick from wall, joint from hinge, screw from wood, substance from structure. The morning mislaid in segments, glimmer and dust like a waking dream from a precipice, I refuse to jump. Downstairs, sounds lean on interruptions. Light, unstable, in these lines of keeping and remove. What is this drift of silence? Where is a willful murmur of our origins? I ask M the next day. Outside. The rose remains in a bucket. Roots absorb all the cold water. Inside, the noise of things falling in their inconsistent, shattered way lament as they stake themselves to our forms where definitions hedge the living we once inhabited. Um, and... Uh, this poem is a sort of a it's a very fresh poem, so it's a working draft so it's a lovely space to, to air this and see how um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to feedback later on um, <laughs> it's, so it's, it's a very loose sonnet and it, it, it has 14 lines um, 
and uh, it, uh, it, it speaks to William Carlos Williams, as you will be able to tell in a minute, and it speaks to um, uh, a, a painting by uh, the Dutch, uh, 17th century Dutch uh, painter, Harman Steenwick, I'm not entirely sure if I'm pronouncing his name, um, and actually, it also speaks to Jeremy's um, poem, earlier poem, which you'll be, uh, which you'll be able to um, work out because it begins with the same uh, line. So that's really nice. I, li I like it when poems uh, do that. Uh, so it doesn't... It, I don't necessarily have a title for it at the moment. It's just Untitled Sonnet. Um, but the, the, the painting is a painting of, of a still life with fruit and with dead birds and stuff. Untitled Sonnet. So much depends upon this apology of what is not eaten and displayed. Death on a table decorated with hair, pheasant, fish, the dead birds adorning edges of our conversation. I mouth a refrain of admission. Tongues part in a working out or through a first time and its end. Indiscretion is a darker glow than power, and what balances on the belly of a thrush, on the wood of all betrayal, is a quiet composure of violence. This form of togetherness, torsion and heft, is speaking of urge or poaching, quint. Grape, peach. That which I saved for breakfast, with the strongest of coffee, is not fruit, nor the artifice of bodies in truancy, nor the note, or the way of telling of, but light, the dark stroke of her venerable hand. Um... And the last poem, it feels fitting, but it's dedicated to Alice Notley, who graciously, um, many years ago, back in 2017, I don't even know whether she probably remembers it, but at the last symposium, um, which um, was organised by R Rona and Yasmin, um, I met and I was, who graciously um, said that I, allowed me to ask her some questions, uh, with regards to her collection, Mysteries of Small Houses, and I was writing a, I've written a PhD chapter on that very collection. Um, and in that collection, uh, there is a poem called House of Self, um, in which Alice, um, as far as I understand it, undergoes a process of um, hypnotism, and she she encounters various spaces of a particular house. Um, and uh, and I love that idea, and I, and I sort of took that on. Um, the other thing that you should know is that at the end of that poem, Alice finishes that poem by saying, "I am what I asked for. I'm speaking. I speak like this." And so I've sort of played around with that. Uh, and the phrase "child heart, child house" is also used in her poem. Um, so this is after House of Self um, for Alice, and my poem is called Body House. There I go, in her voice I find what's missing, and drift in and out of self. Find it hard, all this, going back, to house, my body, house again, my body, body house. Another wall and room, doors open, the smell of ghosts on my body and traces of sapling and oak, young shoulders and grandmother observing, saying, you really are a woman now. At 19, I was, yet still a child, in that child house. How difficult to have missed my growing. Nothing can bring that back. Not this body standing before her. The body in the house I left. The body in the house I came back to. My body house in sunder. Just her and I closing in like trees in woods. Bringing two bodies together. 
two women inside the house of their bodies. And I hover in this coppice of house or blood, cortex and bark, and brush the back of our necks. Pull this breeze between branches and begin moving away again. Always moving. And because of her, I am, I say, I am writing this. I write like this. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, next, we have uh, Robert Hampson, who has the dubious honour of being a former professor of literature in uh, Royal Holloway. Tell us about that. <laughs> and help us become a doctor. <laughs> I tend to lose track of time, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with a poem from um, some time ago, but it seemed the appropriate one to begin with today. And it's called Nostalgia for the Avant-Garde. <laughs> Copper and cinnamon and blue the colour of the sky. A palette intenser than embroidery or hashish. Long transparent flames above the housetops, thundery and edgy, and the faint odor of cat like a disappearing cadence, single handed at the keyboard. The way you look tonight, panther prowls through the long grass, snowdrops and crocuses, and an unidentifiable wallflower, magical and strange, and the cars all disappeared from the streets. And I was going to cut from that to um, a sonnet written for Mayla Losasso in response to her work on the New York School. And it's called White Upon White. That's for May, but also via Jane Jacobs. What kind of city streets are safe? Which city parks are best avoided? Which slums stay slums while others don't? Domestic dreams which money can buy. The fun filtered through the consumable while we wake to pitched roofs or piazzas certain acts and events of attention, and this holding station that doesn't hold, but opens out into anxieties, textual gaps, the leakage of toxic waste. All the buts, yets, weathers, etc., articulate only in completeness. <coughs> and I was going to read um, some other sonnets from a... It's a sequence called Le Mistral, uh, the, Mist, the Mistral, and it was a sequence of seven poems, but I'll read just a few of them. There were images we couldn't see. Powdered limestone whirled by the wind. Petrarch's glimpse of Laura in the cloister. Hello, Simone, we have a situation. Leave off the gold leaf and those long tapering fingers. International Gothic has arrived. And the proto-humanists are queuing up. One day we'll learn to forgive Galileo. Bankers will surrender their bonuses and ExxonMobil will become a philanthropic organization. But for now, the sun still circles the earth, and there are heretics everywhere to be suppressed. And the second one, oh, sorry, number three. Slamming doors and anonymous feet mark the hours of the hotel night. The wind still whips down from the north, and breakfast gets later every day. What's Petrock have to do with it? Pakistan suffers another attack, and Brown will send another 500 troops. You order a sacristan with your coffee, while the card players play another hand. Neither hot nor cold, ice nor fire, though snow has fallen early over Germany, and Tina Turner returns to taunt us. Who needs a heart where a heart can be broken? Who needs to write when the last word isn't spoken? And then the last of these, um, from a memorable event during this visit in Avignon, the farmers are in town, and the police have closed the bridge. Epic battles around the base of the mausoleum. We follow the banners and tractors, haul apples and carrots into the center. Olive and vine cling to the windswept soil, green in November, black in January. Pigs and ducks, cheese from sheep and goats, ready for the table for generations. The supermarkets push down prices, villages deserted, vegetables rot in the fields, fruit remains unpicked. We walk through empty streets, shuttered windows, walls unpainted, plaster peeling.
I was going to read a couple of poems for um, that I wrote on a visit I was in made to Paris for a conference organised by the Poets and Critics Group, um, which was just before lockdown. <coughs> and this one came from the word was given me by Lisa Robertson uh, on the last day of the conference. It's called Nagori, and the, the word is explained in the final lines of the poem. Oh, no, we, no, while we cute P, pure sonic logic drives us onwards. The red-haired singer sings the commune, sings modernism and the world to come. The light ship turned into a restaurant. Josephine Baker become a piscine, while pickpockets dip into our handbags, and greater rogues peddle a dream of power. The train has already left the station, eased silently away from the buffer, green-lighted for an unforeseen future. We try to savour the lingering taste, even the aftertaste of bitterness of the season that will never return. And the third of these um, is dedicated to Olivia Brossard, uh, who's done a lot of translation of the New York School into French. It's called Muskrat Ramble. The deserted streets back to the hotel, the healthful benefits of wine and sex, red faces and animated talk, to put on a play, to publish a book, the paintings that programmed our responses, the reset of imperial memories. You'll find the plug socket under your seat, the poisonous rectal glands of the skunk, where naked and afraid in the trade-off, where beauty and truth have been revalued. Every statement checked for lo its loyalty, every object comes with a warning note. You hold your headphones firmly to your ears. I wear my mask and try to learn how to breathe. In trying to break away from sonnets, I tried to write some extended sonnets, um, a series called Nocturne. I'll read one of those uh, called Practice Room, and it's dedicated to Lowell Lieberman. While everybody has to practice hand positions to shed bad habits, like pressing full strength into the keys, and learns to take in all things, car radios, spices, art, museums, reading Moby Dick, the freedom to explore New York on your own, Everything else is secondary. You never give up some big performance, and then you wake up to silence, the life beyond that doesn't include you. Gargoyles on Spotify, roof tiles and rainwater, it doesn't travel. Not what you had in mind at all. This is Wednesday. You never know when the first commission will come. Recording in the studio, then direct to the dress rehearsal. Always something out of nothing, at the rate of one minute per day. And what I'm going to do um, to end with is a couple of poems from this sequence, uh, Covos 1 to 19, uh, which is what I wrote during the uh, period of lockdown. So I'd write one of these every fortnight based on the events of that fortnight. I'll start with number 10, um, Covo 10, Pang to Eternity. One, the sound of a skeptical espresso machine. It's the same aggressive course a blitzkrieg of tweets that shocked even these northern watchers as boutique narcissism killed more than the virus. Two, there's local lockdowns, but that's okay, as long as MPs and advisors stick to the rules. Local lockdowns could not have been avoided. Don't get lost in the science. Get out there. As far as we know, there's no bottom line. Three, in reality, the same information, but the day is redefined. An indefinite future, though time is running out, in visions of final evaporation. Four. We can imagine a universe in which Trump has vanished. The immensity of this potential universe is none other than the inauguration of the infinite future. Five. He couldn't just break his own rules on isolation. Looking at them en masse, it was possible to see what thousands had already seen, concentric rings in the sky, and the end of another conspiracy theory. Six. The university is dark. There's no, there are no customers today, and there will be none. There will be no more universities, just silence. We have gone through the photographs in his portfolio. His idea is to adopt a dog, or perhaps a tiger. Seven. Clusters of galaxies recede at increasing speeds. Stars are extinguished. Everything reduced to a few black holes and then the singularity recurs. Someone called Einstein the C-word. We end up evaporating, nothing left but a trace of light for all eternity. And I'll end with number 12, which is 
and our little universe. One. This was an unplanned voyage, despite the voices from Mission Control whispering in our ears. After that ceremonial farewell to Soho, perhaps this was just an opportunity to see us home safely. Two. Universities become laboratories. Special advisors are history. Despite the searchlight, some of the images have disappeared. But it's not hard to see the fascist in front of you. Ten years of collaboration send the craft into a spin, but we still have the power to observe the parallels. Three. I can never disappear. I can never leave it alone. All poetry means restrictions, and the measures are already announced. If you're in this business, you can always work from home. It'll be a treat. Four. It's wearing a balaclava, for example, or snatch patrols on the streets of Belarus. We have seen the films and read the books. We recognize the multiple uses of space. Five. The history of satellites is a string of bright communications invisible to the naked eye. The latest novelty spacecraft recalibrates the heavens, the realm of the gods, with influence over us. It's captured by machines who tell us with images what the future will be. Six. To ease the pill, as he puts it, he deploys laboratory staff on the border question. In response to the local lockdown, we need never install a visor. The drugs drafted into the public realm, the reporters stand around the lighthouse to find out the questions they never asked. Seven. There's a party vibe within the two camps, but the bars are closing. Stars are nice, but they flood social media, while the satellite business rewrites the night sky. The speed at which the virus orbits is two weeks beyond intolerable, and London is like some two or three days behind. We're incredibly excited, but will we be able to cope with the ban on exclamations? Eight. We attend to the early stages of human existence, a, a beguiling blend of manual and verbal dexterity. He was one of the first home with the velvety batch of Starlink underground news. Before the potential martini at tea time, he does his rock and roll swagger on a collision course with time. And uh, thank you. Thank thank you. Very much. That gave us a nice sweet <laughs> element. <laughs> thank you. Um, so our final poet in this little roundup before we get to have lunch, hooray, uh, is uh, Karen. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. Um, where are we? Oh, yes. You are a poet and artist and a bedfellow in the Guillemot Press um, archive, as is Bryony. No? Is there another Guillemot Press person here? Someone else is? Maybe not. Anyway, if you like Karen's stuff, you're going to really like mine. Um, Karen, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to begin by reading a couple of poems from my collection, Young Girls. And the poems are a poetic retelling of the life of Indian Hungarian artist Amrita Shergill, who's producing her artwork in the 1920s and 30s, and it takes her to places such as Paris, um, Florence, and also Shimla. So the first one is on a bus with Paul Cezanne. On the bus route home, he thundered upstairs blotchy and red. Red and blue on the inside, but not lost. So much fruit, his ripened cherry squished and bleeding red. Stuffed into his side, back and front pockets of his double-breasted dress coat and trousers of fine wool. He sat in the seat directly in front of me and I could see the back of his neck, yellow. Stripes of orange from the city's August sun. I wanted to say something like, can I give you a bag for your cherries? I thought about opening my mouth wide and leaning in to say something like that, but he lifted his fur felt hat, burgundy, and out rolled a stash of cherries onto the top deck. Six rolled beside my feet. I stamped down on each one quick and hard, popped bloody and red. He let out a yelp, blue breath wafted from his mouth wide. He turned his head and stared at me. 
long, sour, tacky residue on the soles of my shoes. Tap, tap, tap. And this is at the preview. I arrive at the museum, painted turquoise and dressed as a mermaid, confident, knowing that this is what Yoko would want. You tell me that I look ridiculous and what an embarrassment it is to be together at this Cunningham preview, the one you've been awaiting for years. It's what Yoko would want, I say as I adjust my blouse made from an old silk sari, fraying, hollow jade stones attached with yoo-hoo glue, you ask me to wait in the foyer discreetly until the applause, but I won't. I shuffle in with my Kashmiri embroidered tail, undoing cracked calico attached with yoo-hoo glue. Yes, I am shuffling across this polished white floor, and yes, it's distracting, and yes, my silk is fraying, and yes, my tail is undoing, and yes, I am shedding jade stones and calico shells, and yes, they're all looking as I position myself discreetly beside Duchamp. (laughs) Thank you. And the next two poems are from um, my second collection, Poetic Fragments from the Irritating Archive. Um, and the project documents a fictional archive called the Irritating Archive, which was founded in 2017, and the archive is famous for housing irritated, irritating artefacts, irritated objects, and documents of all kind. So I'm going to read from the archivist's notes and the visitor's book. So this first uh, poem here from the visitor's book is called Lost Souls. A body is floating in the Kalang River. There is a tent in the distance. It is Sunday afternoon and on Sundays the unclassified neighbours from across the street head towards the water. They eat game and fowl and discard the bones in Nimishillan Creek. The young release princess balloons which float above the inlet. The old light candles for the water. The body is naked. There is a sign which reads, Prevent Accidents. The body is mystical, its herbaceous outline blooms with lush plastic fruits. It lies underneath the safe spot, prevent accidents. The body floats into an emphatic pose which looks like prevent accidents. The railroad tracks have been classified and form the backdrop to prevent accidents. Sounds can be heard off the Mexican coast and the body p p p joins an auditory system of floating acoustic monitors, prevent the spatial depth, p p p p prevent of the wood scrapyard, a a curtain of tarpaulin, a a is underground in the Elan mine, a a in a duffel bag coat, see along equestrian trail to seed pulled from the canal, a seed and it vanishes and is later identified beside a seed the volcano at Lake Batalan or Banja Luka, see the body is 30 miles from sea, but the lights of the arcades, arcades, accidents, spatial depth, p- clings to the tomb of theatricality, p- p- dizzying prep with profound acceleration, um, dark split corpse, t- on the LA tape hiking trail, ack, lined with stuffed animals, re, vent, ack, this Wednesday night, e, illegal fishing net, e, with amp, d, the amplified fig, d, the amplified figures with a ghostly pallor, dent, the bod, s- the e, e, the e, the body is floating in the Rappahonic River and is buoyed up by the boat ramp which crosses Little Falls. In the distance, there is a tent overlooking the mountain, v, exhumed in a mauntology autopsy of prevent dolphin like clicks to the Abba s, s, abandoned Shiroi city, v, v, n, decomposing miracles which re float, re and disappear, n, canals and showtimes. Ah, the body is hit, n, the creek east of Sopa. Ah, Wellington County and Ak Donegal, C D for shortening the body from near extinction to T Ak pre blows V the Ak bod E floats here. And the visitor's book. Unhappy move. Separating from mother was counterproductive. A burden overstretching the boundaries of regret. Hives popped up in the morning rush. Hives of Polaroid plants in an hour of clash. 
Clash hour is the hour of shouldering the burden which pops the rash on the skin of cows, unhappily mooing in bathtubs of loss. Ooh, moo, ooh, emergency swelling lips and suspicious looks from the passers-by. Unhappy oom board this train. Its roof leaks nasal coon gestion and milk. Ooh, moo, im, oo, noo, gooblins. Mouths open, tongues oot, throat scratch with cries, oof, dis obedience, and waves oof, opinion, plug into an anti booty network. This network is mothers. These tactics which drag and coof are the tactics oof, mother. Mother's milk is runny and itchy sample size. The train beats through emergencies of wheezing and assembling e coo all in the outside. Outside faces civilly press their skin against a roo glass window panes lacking tools to run. Instead, arrested, regretted, affected. And lastly, I'm going to read a little from um, a poem called Gestalt, which was written in response to the Carolee Schneeman exhibition at the Barbican earlier this year. Um, and it's been written as a result of looking through Schneeman's archives and her artworks. The body is abject. Abject is the body. Long live the bro- body. I was drawing before I could speak abject. I try to make images, let's say, of a person coming into a room or something like that. I take 15 pages and strike with the line, and there might be a hand or a finger. To the suburbs, the only person I know was killed in June. Four wheels chug along and then skid into a burgeoning cloud of smoke, and my mouth agape launches into a broadside against divine forces. I pull into one street and then into another. I wait on the curb on the edge of a driveway, the other side of a box hedge. I am here for earthly affairs. The body is abject. Abject is the body. Long live the body. I was drawing before I could speak. Abject. Tonight you make your way in from the door at the back. And now you're sat here and I'm stood here. And you're facing forwards and I'm looking back at you. Your faces glitter with archaic imagery, the good guys, the cowboys, the American apple pie. There's an underlying residue on which our cultures are built, and I look back at your bodies moving. He presents himself in a vulnerable light, having grown up in the countryside, a rural physician. He fixed broke-down bodies right instead of left, back instead of front, up instead of down. Lap broke top, battery broke. Yesterday, I was snorkeling in London and inhabiting movement. Motion is energy and the drawing's kinetic. Your faces glitter with this kind of sacred erotic stuff from a perspective unknown. She leans in. The body is abject. Abject is the body. Long live the body. I was drawing before I could speak abject. Curtains twitch. A body rejected, used up, worn out energies and revelations in pretend temples of happiness. Temples capable only of repetitive suffering, prayer and sacrifice on a living room floor, fresh bread, a toaster, a silhouette of three women carrying a headdress, glamour and feathers and optic cables. Tight belts of edible pineapple, midriffs, llama hair socks. I watch from outside and loudly proclaim, wow. The body is abject, abject is the body, long live the body. I was drawing before I could speak abject. A figure brushes against the bonnet of a car, I duck a figure. Defying barriers of geography, moving from one lawn to the next and then the next. Posting leaflets of package holidays, Charlemagne's castle, King Arthur's cottage, a private teepee on the island in the Tasman Sea. A leaflet 
female placed under my windscreen wiper, a wiper lifted, mild electrocution, compression of a foot pedal. We sit in silence. You face forwards and I'm looking backwards at you, thinking of that door, exhausted. You brought the injured people here tonight. The body is abject. Abject is the body. Long live the body. I was drawing before I could speak abject. A 24-hour supermarket brightly lit on the corner. One street meets another. A deacon, a deity, a Promethean force bound up in desire, aspiration, collective insanity. Neatly lined up with a perfectible destiny. Your music, your poetry, your landscape, but also the violence against you. The body is abject. Abject is the body. Long live the body. I was drawing before I could speak abject. Thank you.